Hey guys, and welcome back to another video on my channel. I hope that you all had a very happy Halloween. As you can see in my background, I still have my Halloween stuff up. I figured we could carry this holiday on for a few more videos because again, it is my favorite holiday and I definitely know that it's some of your guys' favorite holidays as well. So I just wanted to keep this up a little bit longer so that we can get the full effect of Halloween into the month of November because November is a very boring month in my opinion. There's not a lot going on. And so, yeah, I just thought we could carry Halloween over into November a little bit. But with that all being said, let's get right into today's video. I did mention briefly in one of my recent videos that I wanted to talk about the doll Annabelle. However, I do think that Annabelle is overdone not only on YouTube but just in general. It is such an overhyped horror movie and so I didn't want to specifically focus on that and that is when talking about Ed and Lorraine Warren themselves came to mind. I decided that they had crazy and interesting lives and it would be pretty interesting to talk about the couple overall. Ed Warren was born on September 7th, 1928, and Lorraine Warren was born on January 31st, 1927. Both being born and raised in Bridgeport, Connecticut, and both Ed and Lorraine Warren were Catholic and identified with that their entire lives. The couple had met when they were both teenagers. Ed was working at a movie theater and Lorraine would visit this movie theater on a weekly basis. She would go there at least once a week with her mother every single week to catch a film. And during one of these visits, Ed decided to start talking to Lorraine and they started to talk more frequently. And that is when Ed had decided to ask Lorraine on a date. Now, for those of you who may not know, Lorraine Warren claims to be a clairvoyant and she's psychic and she has all of these abilities. And she said that later on in her life, she recalled that upon a first meeting Ed, she had this psychic vision and she knew that she was going to marry him. On Ed's 17th birthday, which would be September 7th, 1945, Ed had actually left because he had joined the army. But just four months after leaving, he would return home because his ship had sank. Now, he was safe, everybody was safe, but he did return home. And during this time when he returned home, that is when him and Lorraine became married. Ed would then return back to his position in the army, but once he returned home from good, that is when him and Lorraine would go on to have their first and only child, a daughter by the name of Judy Warren. Now, to me personally, that kind of stuff isn't too interesting, but it is interesting to know a little bit more about Ed and Lorraine Warren because they are a very, very famous couple in the paranormal community. But let's get into the very more interesting paranormal kind of aspect to their entire lives. So Ed Warren was extremely into the paranormal. He said that his interest in the paranormal peaked at a very young age because he believed that his childhood home was haunted and he was often visited in this childhood home by a woman. He shared this information with Lorraine and because of this, he was very, very interested in all these haunted buildings and visiting places that were paranormal. So as soon as he got wind that that a house in their area was possibly haunted, he would tell Lorraine, you know, this house could very well be haunted, people say there are spirits within there, and then the couple would go and attempt to visit this house or building. I'm sure a lot of you already do know this, but many people are very skeptical about Ed and Lorraine Warren and think that a lot of their cases are made up. I personally think that majority of their cases, whether or not they were, you know, overly done, do have some truth to them. However, I do think that the way that they got into paranormal investigating is very, very strange. Now, something that I did leave out here that I just realized is that Ed Warren was a self-proclaimed demonologist. And again, Lorraine Warren was a clairvoyant. So now let's talk about how Ed and Lorraine Warren really got into being paranormal investigators and how they got invited into these people's homes, which again, I think is super weird. So Ed was a very, very talented artist. And so when he heard that a house in their neighborhood or in their area or wherever was haunted, he would take all of his art supplies and his paint supplies and he would go and sit outside of these people's homes for hours until he was done painting an absolutely gorgeous picture of the house. However, he would add his own kind of spin on these paintings and he would add ghosts and whatnot in the windows of this painting. After he was finished with the painting, he would give it to Lorraine and she would basically go and show the homeowner this beautiful painting that her husband had done of the house and basically charm herself into getting an invite into the home. She would stand there and really, really persuade these people into inviting her and Ed into their houses. Now, I personally think that is extremely sketchy. I don't know 
what would make them think of this, but it did end up working because then they did get to go inside all of these allegedly haunted homes. In 1952, that is when Ed and Lorraine Warren had founded the New England Society for Psychic Research. That is also when Ed and Lorraine Warren had opened up their very famous Warren Museum. Now, I'm sure that if you were into horror movies or paranormal things in general at all, then you've probably heard of the Warren's Museum, and that is where they very famously keep the doll Annabelle. And now this is where I kind of want to start talking about more of the paranormal stuff and the creepy stuff and the stuff that would have been perfect to go up on Halloween if only I had planned my schedule a little bit better. Ed and Lorraine Warren were always very open about the cases that they covered and the things that they experienced while they covered these cases and the couple claimed that they were sharing all of this information for educational purposes. Something that I do just want to mention before we get really into the creepy stuff is Ed and Lorraine Warren have worked on some very, very famous cases that eventually turned into very big Hollywood movies. One of these movies being Annabelle, which I have mentioned before. Um, they also worked with the Syndicker family, which is from the movie, or which is the family that inspired the movie Haunting in Connecticut. They also worked in the Amityville Horror House, both of which of those cases I have previously done videos on, and I'll have those both linked down below for you guys. Although, like I already mentioned, I do think that the Annabelle case is extremely overdone here on YouTube. It is a case that I personally find to be very interesting, so I did want to brush up on it just a little bit. I'm not going to go too, too in-depth because I'm sure all of you have probably heard of this case at least a little bit um, because it is so, so popular. But again, I did just want to brush the surface because I did want to talk about it. However, I didn't want to dedicate an entire video to this topic. So for those of you who may not know, Annabelle was, or I guess still is, what is said to be a very, very haunted Raggedy Ann doll. A nursing student has received the Annabelle doll in the 70s as a gift, but shortly after bringing the Annabelle doll into her home, that is when she started to very visibly see signs that this doll was not your ordinary doll, and that it was very, very obviously inhabited by a spirit. Because of all the paranormal activity that was happening within the nurse's home after bringing this doll into her house, the girl decided to reach out to a psychic medium. The psychic medium came over and met with the nurse and all of her roommates and they talked about the doll and that is when the psychic medium told them that she believed that the doll was inhabited by a young girl by the name of Annabelle Higgins. She told them that Annabelle was harmless and that she was just the spirit of a young girl and because of this, the nurse and her roommates invited Annabelle to permanently live within this Raggedy Ann doll. However, that would prove to be a very, very bad idea because this was not an innocent spirit. The entity did introduce itself as Annabelle and portrayed itself to be a young girl. However, it was a super, super demonic presence that was living within this Raggedy Ann doll. Now, I'm sure most of you have seen the Annabelle movies and you've definitely seen some YouTube videos about the Annabelle doll, so I'm not going to go into the entire case, but I do want to talk about one very strange thing or a couple very strange things that happened to Ed and Lorraine Warren while they were working on this case. One night after it had come very clear that this spirit was not going to leave the Annabelle doll, that is when Ed and Lorraine Warren had the doll within their possession and Lorraine was responsible for transporting the doll from wherever it was at this time to the Warrens Museum. She put the doll very securely into her vehicle and that is when she said she had a near-death experience that she jocked up to the spirit that was inside of this Raggedy Ann doll. Lorraine was driving as normal when all of a sudden her steering wheel and her brakes just completely stopped working. This caused Lorraine Warren to get into a severely bad crash, which she again chalked up to the Annabelle doll. After this, they brought the Annabelle doll back to the museum and they completely soaked it in holy water. Another incident with this doll that had taken place after the doll was within the Warren's care is when a man and a woman had visited the Warren's museum. Well, in the museum, that is when a young man had decided to test his luck with the Annabelle doll and he started to violently bang on her glass case in which she is kept in. After seeing this absolutely disrespectful behavior, the man was asked to leave the museum. However, that would not be the end of his tragedy. As soon as they left the museum, this man and woman got into an extremely bad car accident, causing both of them to sadly pass away. Many people do believe that this accident was caused because of the man's disrespect towards the Annabelle doll. 
The next case that I want to talk about in today's video is a case that I personally didn't even know that Ed and Lorraine Warren had worked on, but it is also a case that I personally find to be extremely interesting. And that is the case of Arnie Cheyenne Johnson, also known as the Devil Made Me Do It case. Now this case is extremely interesting and in the future I definitely would like to dive into this case a little bit deeper. However, for the purpose of today's video, again, I'm just going to be really brushing the surface. This specific case is famous because it was the first case in American history that the court allowed them to use possessed by a demonic presence as a defense, claiming that Arnie was innocent. Now, no matter how often I read about this kind of thing and no matter how many times I get really deep invested in this paranormal stuff, I don't understand how you can use that as a defense. I know that might sound a little bit naive or, you know, close-minded to some of you, but me personally, I just don't know how that could be used as a defense in a court of law. In short, on November 24th, 1981, in Brooksfield, Connecticut, Arnie Johnson was convicted of manslaughter after brutally attacking his landlord, Alan Bono. According to the testimonies of the Glatzell family, their 11-year-old son, Donald, was playing host to a demonic presence. This demonic presence was the same demonic presence that had forced Ernie to kill Alan. This possession had allegedly gone on for some time, and with the family not knowing what to do, they enlisted for the help of Ed and Lorraine Warren. When the Warrens arrived at the home, and that is when they had several priests come into the home, and they performed multiple exorcists on young David. This entire thing took allegedly several days, but eventually the demonic presence did end up leaving David's body. However, what the family didn't know was that the demonic presence had left David's body and was now embodying Ernie. A few months after this had all taken place is when Ernie would go on to kill his landlord, Alan, during a heated argument. Once in court, that is when they started to defend Ernie, saying that he could not be held responsible for this crime because he was possessed. But as you can probably imagine, that did not hold up very well in court, and Ernie Johnson was sentenced to 20 years. However, he only ended up serving five of those. Ed and Lorraine Warren also famously worked with the Smurl family, which was the family that inspired the movie or the TV movie, I guess, called The Haunting. Now, I do believe that this TV movie only aired on TV in 1991. However, after diving into the case, it does seem to be pretty interesting, although I never saw the movie The Haunting myself. The Smurl family consisted of Jack, Janet, their two young daughters, and Jack's parents. The family moved into a duplex apartment on Chase Street in West Pinson, Pennsylvania. The duplex that the family had moved into was not in great condition, but the family was very confident that they could fix it up and make it into their very own. However, once they started to do, you know, these little odd jobs around the duplex, that is when things started to go very, very wrong. The strangeness within this home started out pretty harmless. One of the things that they happened was that they were working with these tools and then they disappeared and they showed up again in a place where they shouldn't be. However, just like in most of these haunted cases that we talk about on this channel, the hauntings proceeded to get worse and worse. One day, while the strangeness was continuing to escalate, the family was just going about their business within the home. However, none of them were in the kitchen when all of a sudden, all of the kitchen's appliances caught on fire. After investigating, they found something that made this entire thing that much stranger. None of these kitchen appliances had even been plugged in. Eventually, while well within the home, the family members would all start to report that they were overtaken by a very foul odor that could not be explained away, which seems to be a very common thing in these kind of haunted house situations, but that was not enough for the Smurl family to want to move away. At this time, Jack was really excelling in his new job, and Janet was pregnant with their third child, and things seemed to be going fairly well despite the fact that their home life was a little bit shaken up. However, that would all kind of take a very down downward nosedive, all thanks to the spirits that were living within the family's home. Again, like I mentioned, one of the main reasons that they were not moving out of this home was because Jack was working in the area and he was really excelling in his job. However, once the haunting really started to take off, that is when Jack started to really struggle to make ends meet. On top of that, Mary, Jack's mother, who again was living with them, she became extremely ill. 
Soon after that, Mary and Janet would start to report hearing each other talking badly about one another when the other one wasn't even in the home. So clearly, you know, Janet wasn't talking mad about Mary and Mary wasn't talking about Janet. It was the spirits who were messing with the women's heads. The most horrifying thing that happened within this home is that Janet would go on to report that she was being molested by an invisible spirit. Now at first, Jack just really brushed this off, thinking that maybe his wife was being a little bit ridiculous, but soon after Janet had started to tell Jack about all of these horrible things that were happening to her, that is when Jack started to kind of witness these horrible things for himself. One night while the couple was lying in bed, that is when Jack claimed that he had heard the whisper of a young woman. He rolled over thinking that this whisper was coming out of his wife, but when he was looking at her, he noticed that she was completely asleep and that is when he saw what appeared to be a dark shadowy figure moving up his wife's leg. I'm sure that you can kind of imagine what happened next. I don't want to dive too deeply into that because it is pretty disgusting, um, but it was a very traumatizing experience. At this point, the entire family was really, really being affected by the haunting within the home. Not just Jack, Janet, and Mary, but their kids as well. In fact, one day while they were standing in kind of like the main common area of the home, a huge chandelier fell out of the ceiling and landed on top of Jack and Janet's young daughter, obviously extremely injuring her on impact. She did end up being okay, but she was severely hurt by the chandelier falling out of the ceiling. The Smurls claimed that their dog was physically picked off the ground and thrown at the wall. Janet also claimed that she was on one occasion picked right up off of the ground and hucked across the room. Not knowing what else to do and only hearing good things about Ed and Lorraine Warren, that is when the Smurl family decided to reach out to the Warrens. The Warrens decided to take their case and they came to investigate the home and while investigating, that is when Lorraine had said that she had found that the Smurl family was dealing with four entities. One of the entities was a harmless elderly woman. The second entity was of a man who died but severely suffered within the home. There was another entity within the home which was a young girl who Lorraine believed could be extremely violent. And the fourth one was of a very demonic presence who actually manipulated the other three spirits into doing these horrible things and ultimately ruining the Smurl's life. Once all of this information about the entities within the home was found out, that is when they decided to hold several exorcisms, multiple cleansing, all of this kind of stuff within the home, but none of it seemed to help. And the Smurl family was growing extremely frustrated and not sure what to do. They decided to kind of post their story in the media in hopes that somebody would come forward and be able to help them. However, after posting their story in the media, this just kind of really got them negative attention. It called out all these ghost hunters and people who were interested in, you know, haunted houses and things like that. So much to the point that the Smurl family had strangers camping out on their front lawn. But none of this was helping, obviously. It wasn't getting rid of the spirits. None of the exorcisms got rid of the spirits. It just seemed that the Smurls didn't really have an option of whether to live with all of these demonic spirits or move out of the home. In 1987, after growing extremely irritated with the haunting and the attention from the media and the strangers camping on their property at all times, that is when the Smurl family decided to move out of the duplex. They claimed that after moving out of this home, that the demonic presence that were living within the duplex ended up following them, but they got their new home cleansed in 1989, and after that, they claimed that they had never had a paranormal experience since. The new owners of the duplex on Chase Street also claimed that they had never ever had any paranormal experiences within the duplex, so it seems that the demons and the ghosts and the spirits that were living inside of that duplex have since moved on. That's really all I have to talk about about the Ed and Lorraine Warren cases, but I did want to mention that their museum still runs and is being taken care of. Unfortunately, since that time, Ed Warren had passed away at the age of 79 in what is claimed to have been by unknown forces. Nobody really knows what Ed passed away from. And Lorraine Warren passed away at the age of 92, just from old age. But guys, that is all that I have for you on today's case. If you like this video, please give it a big thumbs up. Don't forget to comment down below what you'd like to see in my future videos. And don't forget to subscribe and turn on that notification bell so that you don't miss any future videos from me. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.